it's so hard to answer that because I'm just running through like a Rolodex of projects and I'm thinking, was that the unifying theme? Maybe some recent projects that, um, you know, you've consulted on or in the past that uh, you did some good job on and had some recommendations, but then they didn't get implemented. And you're like, well, why is that? I think whenever you're dealing with, with people who aren't you, you have to kind of appeal to their self-interest. And I don't, I don't really see a lot of that. So for example, I've just been hired onto a project by the CFO of the company. Like why would a CFO hire a customer experience guy? Well, it's because we met at a um, round table discussion where I was talking to CFOs about how you can make money from, from CX initiatives. And he seemed to think that rightly or wrongly, I, I kind of knew how to make money from this. So when they needed somebody, they were like, well, why don't we hire the guy who knows how to make money? Because like, that's what we're kind of interested in. And, and I think that perhaps a, big, a bigger challenge than the one that you've just articulated, and, and of course that is a challenge, is antagonism. It's just not taking the time. Ironically, customer experience people don't give their own companies a very good experience as customers when they're trying to help serve them, right? They tend to be a bit too chest beaty they tend to look down on other disciplines and that does not serve them well. Um, so I think it's like, I've made, managed to form really powerful alliances with people in marketing and brand or finance just by taking the time to understand them, which is exactly what a CX practitioner would advocate for the customer, right? <laughs> so I think you really need to try and understand the people that you're working with and, and what success looks like for them and how you can align your interests rather than just kind of trying to steamroller things through. I'm always thinking in those terms. Nice, nice. Hey, so, so we're talking a bit about measurement here, uh, which is a good lead on to, to another little segment I want to ask you about, which is, um, <laughs> you know, let's just say any firm and they're in the CX department, uh, what are the sort of three metrics that you'd be setting up and measuring uh, across the board? I wouldn't be. I would be looking at project specific metrics to show the value of the work that I'm doing. So the problem with, with these big compound metrics, like let, let's take satisfaction, for example, if I lower the price and I give you the same level of service, are you going to be more satisfied? Probably. Hmm. If I keep the service the same and I raise the price, you're going to be less satisfied. Probably. Unless it's a Veblen good, probably, right? If I keep the price the same and I improve the product, satisfaction is going to go up. If I keep those things the same and I improve the messaging and the awareness and the campaign around it, satisfaction is probably going to go up. Like, like I did with the Accord with, with Honda, right? So the challenge with those things is that as a CX practitioner, you volunteer to be measured on something that's beyond your control, which seems to me to be eminently stupid. <laughs> it's, it's like being a, a procurement guy and volunteering to have your effectiveness uh, measured on profit, which is emergent from everybody's activities rather than just the cost that you're controlling, right? Or, so, or marketing measured on, um, you know, uh, demand <laughs> from the market yeah, which is it, at the mercy of macroeconomic factors half the time anyway. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Exactly. So that's my gripe with these things. It's not that they're not important metrics. Like, of course you want to know whether people are satisfied or pissed off with you or, or how that is changing and, and why. But I always, I just think it makes sense to couple the measurement to the activity that you, that, that you're undertaking. In, in a very clear way. And that's what allows you to say, we did A, we measured it with B, the result was C, yada, yada, right? Rather than saying, we measured this thing, to be fair, a million and one factors affect it, but we're gonna claim it was us. And it went up one point, and we're not sure how that actually relates to money. <laughs> like that's not an especially compelling 
pitch to a CFO who's and if like it goes down the next month, then it wasn't our fault. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and if it goes down the next month, it was those guys in price. Nothing to do with or, us. Yeah. Or, 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 <laughs> yeah. So it, exactly. So I don't really think about general metrics in the way that other people do. I tend to be like, what's the aim of the project? How do we measure whether we've achieved that goal? How does that translate into money? Rather than let's set some really weird nebulous metric and hope and pray that it translates into money. And shove it on a live dashboard. You forgot that point as well. Yeah. <laughs> like that to me is just, yeah, I'm, I've got no interest in having those conversations okay. any more than I already have had with people. <laughs> Good point. Well, the same thing happens with me marketing. It's like, oh, there's like a million metrics. Like, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, what's something about your discipline that most people believe is true, but which you know to be wrong? Bit of a curly question. For my discipline specifically, I think yes. it's probably it's probably that you can grow substantially through loyalty effects. I think it's probably the biggest dogma that needs to be questioned. I mean, it's not even a question for me because I've read the research as you have that shows that there's safety in 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 numbers. But the one thing that always gets trotted out is it's a very one dimensional argument about the cost of retaining versus acquiring a, a customer rather than how brands actually grow. So I think, yeah, the, the, probably the biggest thing would be around the loyalty, like enthroning loyalty and, and treating acquisition as if it's some kind of dirty, dirty penalty for not doing well enough on loyalty <laughs> I like it. which is is quite patently not true i was just thinking maybe that stems from the sort of traditional aspect of cx which is you know customer service and satisfaction and like you know oh we've got a churn problem that's a let's get the cx department to, to, to solve that problem you know because that will yeah. grow us if we retain those customers but yeah maybe that's why it's so yeah. ubiquitous within the cx field yeah that would be probably my 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 biggest my biggest one. And then beyond, beyond the discipline, I think the biggest misnomer in business is that being cleverer is the solution to problems, whereas most of the time it's being luckier. <laughs> good, good old halo effect. I love it. <laughs> yeah. you know, I was, I was yeah. talking to some other people recently about um, COVID and um, it's really interesting. A lot of businesses now have a, a baseline measurement for a lot of things that never had a baseline measurement before. Um, so it's a real opportunity for a lot of businesses now to um, like, especially when it comes to marketing demand gen, like um, with people not allowed to go out, a lot of these physical stores now have a perfect baseline of sales. Um, so they can sort of get better at modeling. Um, these oh, that's like interesting. I never models. considered that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they kind of reached a, a total baseline because nobody could physically go and yes. shop. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. yeah I've exactly. never considered that. Hey, so um, let's go on to some lighthearted things. What are some of the funniest moments you've experienced in, 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 your, in this field or your experience in general so far? Oh, what, at, at work? Yeah, like professionally um, with a project or, or something like that. Oh my God, man. <laughs> that is a very good question and, and, and one that I could probably discuss at length. I've had so many very, very, very weird encounters at work. You know, things that are kind of like pinch me, why am I here kind of moments through to this utterly absurd things. Let's I mean, like, for the, example, the absurd thing, that sounds good. Well, I mean, I've, I've worked on a project that spent $200 million of investor money and delivered nothing before. What was that SoftBank? Uh, no, it was, a, it was before the Vision Fund. <laughs> um, but it was, um, it was just amazing. It was amazing to watch. Amazing to, to watch and, and that it was probably avoidable. And that informed a lot of my thinking about, I mean, occurrences like that prompt you to think and re reflect, right? And it really made me think like, no amount of UX design is going to make this product into something that people want, you know, like it really brought it into sharp relief, the need 
and the distinction between the experience and the conceptual idea of value as perceived worth as a belief in the customer's mind you know and, and i really and adoption barriers in particular with that one uh, i wrote about it in the grid i've had all sorts of utterly utterly weird weird experiences with, with with people with clients that show that fundamentally business is a human activity and and all of the kind of this idea that it should be hyper rational and based on analysis is a total fiction you know so as soon as individuals and the reductionist view of success perhaps in in marketing is is wrong definitely definitely so yeah i've seen some massive flame outs i've seen some Fortunately, some pretty big successes to counterbalance them. So tell me about the success then. Is there a good example you're really proud of, even no matter how big or small? Yeah, well, um, I actually added a page to my website a couple of days ago, which lists the projects that I've kind of that I've done in the last 15 years. And the one that I always come back to because it, it just set everything else in motion and I was very, very lucky was designing designing a website as my first job out of university for a travel company. Uh, so they're P and O ferries. They did cross channel ferries from England to France. And, um, they were facing pretty intense competition from the tunnel, uh, and then from EasyJet and these low cost airlines. And it's like, we really need to sharpen our website and worked with a great team there. And that project doubled, the online turnover of the business and had a 10 to one ROI as I understand it. Wow. And having that as your first and project, it was a transactional site. It was multilingual. It was quite complex having it kind of winning awards. Well, not awards, but being very highly rated as the most usable travel site in the country and having had a hand in that, like that set up my whole career basically. So if it hadn't been for that one, yeah, I, I, God knows where I would be. So I'm very grateful for, for that project. And we've had other similar projects in terms of where clearly the user experience or customer experience has been the problem and fixing it has given huge results. But the problem is when people try and fix it and it's not the problem and then it doesn't give the results, right? And it's just something that people often assume is the problem when it isn't because of, hey, well, of this well, current on, faddishness. Uh, on that note then, what are some things you thought would work, like projects you've worked on, you're like, okay, we're going to do this and it's probably going to work, but have failed. So is your time to sort of fess up to some of the things uh, or your own failures? Too, too numerous to, <laughs> to mention probably. I mean, but what I, what I try and do with projects is um, I, I like to think about a, a fuse box in a house where the fuse blows to stop the whole house going up in flames, right? So whenever I'm working on any project, I try and put fuses in place such that if I'm badly wrong on something or if we've got an incorrect assumption that there are gates or trip switches in place that stop things from progressing much much further. So I've had tons of ideas for products and services or startups or little businesses where those fuses have blown and it's, I've like been able to stop at a very early stage before I've, before I've pursued it, uh, intensely. That's a really um, good analogy. I really like that approach. It's like little threshold points, which you're like, no, let's cut our losses, like walk away, fold, yeah. fold the hand, you know, let's just stop. Let's just stop right here. So I've never had in my personal life or in my own business, like a massive flame out where I've really thought this is the one and it's been a, a catastrophe. I've, I've certainly never, never had that, but it's because I've, I've never really doubled down on anything until I've been pretty sure that it's, it's going to work and I've got no problem in, I, I call it kind of constructive abandonment <laughs> rather than failure, well, which it, is. It sounds like you're good at managing risk, put it that way. You're very adept in that field because that's, that's the way I risk. Management. I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning. I mean, I'm actually learning. I'm writing a book at the moment with a risk manager. So I'm learning yeah, a lot from, <laughs> from him. But yeah, I've, I don't think I've ever had a, a massive failure uh, in, in where I've thought 
oh for sure this is going to be the one and then it just hasn't hasn't worked out if anything i'm a bit of a negative nelly and i'm kind of pleasantly surprised <laughs> more right. often than okay than well otherwise. here's a better question what did you get wrong in one of your earlier books or what do you wish that you, you know didn't include or excluded or did differently oh i mean so this is this is a really good question because so the 10 principles book the 10 principles behind great customer experiences I haven't read it since I proofread it in 2012. So I've never read it as a physical book. Um, I dipped into it with preparing uh, presentations and, and, and that kind of thing. The 10 principles themselves, I'm astonished at how well they've held up. That has been amazing, but I would probably be mortified if I read the opening sections outlining the case for customer experience in terms of having written it at a time when I wasn't savvy about marketing uh, or even less savvy than I am now, I should probably say, or about brand building or about growth or about uh, the balance of acquisition and, and retention. But, you know, that comes from having written a book when I was 28, you know, and now being, I mean, how much can you know? Well, it's, it's very uh, natural. Uh, it's like Dunning-Kruger, right? <laughs> In a way. Yeah. I was very yeah, opinionated. So, and I thought I was definitely right. Like even five years ago, I'm like, no, that's not the way you should do it. And then I'm like, wait a minute, actually. <laughs> yeah. I'll take that back. <laughs> exactly. So I atoned from the sins of my first book with the second and I'll atone for the sins of the second with the third. You know, I'm, I'm, this is one of my one of my frustrations i think just with the discipline at large is that i've eaten the humble pie like i've been wrong on things and i've gone back and i've said you know i was wrong about that i was wrong about nps when i first heard about it i thought this sounds pretty good <laughs> but then when i when i dug into it and i really started to look at it and i really started to see what other people had to say and I had that broader context of system dynamics, I realized like, you'd have to be a fool. And clearly I was a fool. So <laughs> like I, I've never had a problem with, with changing my mind about those things. And I wish other people were, were more like that. So yeah, plenty of, plenty of things where it's not been wrong per se sometimes it has been outright wrong but a lot of times it's just been oversimplified yeah. yeah and and as you know like so much of what makes the world interesting isn't that it's black or white it's, it's shades of gray yeah. and it's knowing when your contacts context sorry mandates a certain solution so yeah i've, I've been wrong I've been wrong a lot, but I've also been very grateful for it because you learn a lot more from things that that don't work than, than things that Big do. Time. Yeah. And I think like, and so I'm going to keep trying to be wrong. And as a business owner as well, I think you, you don't have anyone else to blame, right? Like yourself, uh, it's different working for someone else, but you, can, you know, maybe uh, pass off some of that failure onto others, but it's, it's all on you. Right. So maybe, you know, your ego definitely gets a bit of a check and, um, that's why I wanted to interview as well, because that's the kind of theme of, of this podcast. Hey, uh, I saw recently on social media um, that you liked a quote that said, you have to be an expert in a field in order to be able to figure out who the true experts are. So yeah. with that said, who are the true experts in the CX field right now, apart from yourself? Well, who are the true experts? It depends on what slice of the pie you want to look at. So there are definitely certain people where I think they have an interesting insight. So like Matt Dixon, who wrote um, The Effortless Experience, and he wrote The Challenge of Sales. So he's not a, a pure CX guy. I thought, here's a guy who's who's really thinking about about the topic. I struggle to answer the question because, and, and, and I have to be 100% clear on this, it's because I'm not 
immersed in the community in terms of spending my time discussing these things with with other experts i'm always trying to look outside the field at other experts who i think you know they they really know what they're they they have something that we as a discipline could learn from hey, so, right? okay. so even better um like you mentioned rory you mentioned uh, mr dixon um even related yeah. fields like maybe marketing or branding or sales or something like that yeah so i i like back to our so just just to finish your first point okay. any of the any of the kind of gurus and influencers in customer experience the noted ones they have value to add in terms of their perspective on the discipline there are those whose opinion i don't necessarily respect uh in, in oh, sorry whose opinions i don't necessarily agree with but i respect the fact that we need a plurality of opinions so anyone who has written a decent book on on this stuff like joe pine has written a, a wonderful book on it uh is is another one there are all sorts of people who have written great books on this any of those books have value to bring any of those uh experts or pundits have value to bring are we all universally right absolutely not none of us is so i i always think that you should in fact, Ian Williams is another guy on LinkedIn who I think has a lot of good stuff to say on this topic. I mean, there are, there are loads of, of, of people whose opinions I, I really trust on it, but I really gravitate towards marketers rather than CX people because I think they have a broader perspective on, on, on things, right? So if I was to try and get the CX community to read a, a book, it would probably be How Brands Grow. Because yeah. it would just put a wrecking ball for everything that they believe to be true. Let's say the marketing industry as well while you're at it. <laughs> most, yeah, people have, but, most people have either read it and don't agree with it and just put it to the side <laughs> or uh, I've never heard of it. Yeah, but I, I actually like part two more than part one. Yes. I yes. think there was a slight softening of the tone. Yes. Yeah. And it's marginally less antagonistic. Well, Jenny wrote more of that one, didn't she? I think. Yeah, I think Jenny, well, I don't know, but I, I think part two was, was my preference. Um, so I, I would like people to step outside the field more than, than, than look inwards. Yeah. You know, I, 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 and, and that's a major challenge is that culturally it's kind of a mono block and, and I would prefer, so there's this organization, the CXPA customer experience professionals association. I ended up in some dialogue with the CEO and he's like, well, yeah, we are trying to change things. We're going to change things by, um, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to ask our membership what they think. And I'm like, they're the last fucking people you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to ask them. What you want to do is create a steering group of people from brand, marketing, operations, finance, HR, whatever, and have all these outside people give their perspective on it rather than just like navel gazing within your own industry about how it should work. Yeah. You know, so I, it's not that I don't think that there are a lot of, there are a lot of very, very competent and experienced professionals in there. Claire Musket is another friend of mine and she's more in the human side of things rather than the design or operational uh, side of things, I guess. Um, but yeah, I just think we all need to be looking outwards rather than inwards. So that's like my that. take on that. No, that's really good. I mean, you know, that committee suffer from group think, you know, at the worst of times and representative yeah. samples of, of yeah. the population. So I like how you're saying your customer really is the other departments and disciplines within the, the company as well. So I, I think that's, that having that perspective is, is really um, good. Um, now I ask all my guests, um, this scotch is really good, by the way. I've been sipping it really slowly, but it's, it's just, just piling through it. I think I've finished the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> just the lingering flavor. It just goes on and on and on. And um, like you said before, I, I, the, once you start getting into whiskey geek, you start talking about your sherry casks and, you know, Olorosos and your, your rum casks and bourbon casks. And I think this one has just hit the melding of those two flavor components perfectly where it creates this new seamless taste. And there's, there's no one thing you could go, oh, that's definitely sherry or that's definitely bourbon. It's just this new flavor dimensions that are blended together. Um, it's magnificent. So good. I'm um, a big fan. I tried to get the one that you really wanted, the number one choice. So this is our backup, but it's, um, 
Yes. It's oh, the Offerman. Offerman Lagvulin. Yes, it was some uh, very small release that was done. And, um, you know, I'm pretty good with sourcing this stuff. And that one was just, I asked a lot of people on the know and no one knew. So it, it would have been a private collection somewhere at someone's house. Um, I can see you... it from here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so um, you, uh, when I sent you this question as well with the, uh, the books that um, you're reading, uh, you did write some down. Um, you mentioned one earlier in the, in the conversation. Um, what are some books that you're reading right now or have read recently that um, you definitely recommend people read? You mentioned the financial intelligence one. Um, I think it was by Karen. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So uh, financial intelligence is a, is a really good book. You um, mentioned mastery as well um, by Robert Greene. And I bought that on your recommendation. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. I really enjoyed that book because it reassured me that I'm, I'm an apprentice, <laughs> <laughs> not a master. <laughs> which was kind of uh, yeah uh i really enjoyed i really like i mean robert green and i think his writing is almost like a tarantino movie in that you can tell from a still frame that it's kind of a tarantino film you can tell from a paragraph almost that it's robert green's writing and i've got no idea how you achieve that but yeah for, for me um mastery is is a is a wonderful wonderful book okay. um it's interesting when you put people put me on the spot about book recommendations because I've read I'm the same. so, so many. many. I mean, it's like I've read at least 450 books just on my field of work. What, what about a, a recent one that you've, that you've been recommended or started reading and you like? Uh, I recently came across the investor Howard Marks who runs a business called Oak Tree Capital here in the States. And he's written a book called The Most Important Thing. And he also has memos, week, monthly memos or whatever that you can subscribe to. And he's, a, he's an investor. And he's a, he's a thinking man. He's an intellectual and he, he writes wonderfully. But he has this wonderful humility about him, kind of Buffett-esque in terms of his descriptions of the world. And in the way that he describes things that just make things that you'd never thought of seem breathtakingly obvious, which is yeah. kind of delicious and annoying simultaneously. So um, I, read, um, I read a book by Howard Marks recently um, called The Most Important Thing. I'm just trying to think what else I've, I've read recently that really hit the spot with me. You did um, mention um, in our early conversation Thinking in Systems and... Oh yeah, Donella Meadows. Yeah, that's an amazing book. Because uh, you mentioned primer, that earlier in conversation about primer. system thinking within the organization. Oh, so, so crucial. Yeah, so, so crucial. Um, oh, um, well, Rory's book is amazing. Alchemy. So Alchemy? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's great. Yeah. Uh, I also enjoyed Simply Better, uh, which was making the point that rather than trying to have a unique selling point, you just want to make a better product than your rivals because the basics in aggregate count for more than clever differentiators or unique selling points. Mm, um, oh, two other amazing books that I read recently, Gap Selling by Keenan. Oh, Everyone read. in business should read that. Okay. Gap Selling. Oh my God, just going to turbocharge your sales game, whoever you are. And whatever you're I'm selling. I'm definitely reading that one then. <laughs> What's the oh, other one? Gap Selling by Keenan is, is absolutely awesome. Um, the Management Myth by Matthew Stewart, which basically says that management and strategy and the way that consultancies peddle things is an utter farce. I thought that was great. Uh, I just launched a Kindle app on my Mac so I can see the last kind of books that I read. Nice. Uh, you also mentioned uh, nature technology. What? How? What? How oh, the nature of technology. Yeah. Uh, w. Brian Arthur, amazing book. Okay. Basically says that how how technology evolves. Absolutely, absolutely awesome. Wow. I love that book. I love that book. Um, an oldie but a goodie is Founders at Work. If people are interested in startups. Because it's got the story of how all these massive companies that are now multi-billion dollar companies got started. 
and you realise that it was basically a total shit show every time and it was a complete joke and they just kind of made it up as they went along and eventually it was total magic. Or they, or they glorify the, uh, it started in a garage and then they failed to mention that, oh, the principal and the business's parents were very well connected with the massive corporation or had a huge <laughs> yeah. trust fund behind them, which funded the whole enterprise. Well, occasionally, yeah, occasionally. But that is a really, really good book, uh, Founders at Work. It's okay. really old, but um, I like it. Paul Graham wrote the intro for it and he's interviewed in it as well. Uh, the Halo Effect is another really good book that I think most people need to read because they don't see when it's coming into play and it's kind of insidious. Mm. Uh, Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke is a, a wonderful book for just trying to get people to think more probbabilistically. Okay. I mean, I could just that's go on. I think those I, I are, think those like are 15, some of the so. <laughs> Normally I say three, yeah. so that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm especially at the moment because I'm in writing mode. I'm reading, I'm reading a couple of books a week, so I'm just chewing through them. Yeah. Um, yeah, trying to hoover up these kind of uh, insights that I need. Well, there's not much else to do when you're in lockdown, right? So it's it's a good place to to spend your time. Well, lockdown with a toddler is a different matter altogether. But I can't oh, do that much. Oh, Maybe get some good <laughs> noise cancelling headphones when you're reading them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, noise hey, cancelling um, headphones on top of noise cancelling headphones. Speaking of that, I know it's getting late, so I've got two more questions. Um, sure. Favorite website? If you wanted other people to bookmark and visit this website, can be anything. Uh, what do you recommend? Oh, pass. Okay, that's fine. You've got Honestly, enough. Honestly, I can't there. think. That, that's I can't better. think of a of a good website. What about a piece of tech? Google. That, Google, yeah. <laughs> Some people said LinkedIn or Google. I was like, oh, great, thanks. <laughs> but, you know, I've got no idea. I mean, you know, the number of questions that you get asked um, internally at a company, like, how do I do this? I'm like, have you Googled it first? I always say, at least Google it. Because if you've got the question, chances are someone else has had it before. Start there and then come back to me with a better question. <laughs> yeah, I'm really, uh, it's, it's so hard to think. So, yeah, in the same vein, some people say like, who do you think has a great customer experience? They ask me all the time. My mind just goes blank as soon as I'm asked. And I'm like, hey, I'm I see you've got, um, you've got AirPods in. Um, yeah. Are they called AirPods? Or? I'm not an Apple person. AirPods. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So AirPods, um, yeah. is there a piece of tech that you use all the time that you just couldn't do without? Ironically, I'm not really a tech guy. Um, I use my Mac, obviously, every day, my laptop which Maybe is connected a to a big program. monitor that you're sat on top of. I use um, uh, my Kindle every day because I'm, I'm reading all the time, phone every day. But the technology that's always brought me pleasure has been a bit more simplistic. So I have a lovely camera because I love taking photos, which I use almost every day, which is um, it's the Model Q Leica, so the baby Leica. Yeah, yep, yeah, I know it. I've had God knows how many cameras because I, I, it used to be my job before I got into design. So, uh, and, and it's a serious hobby of, of mine. I always steered clear of the brand because I thought they were just for kind of pretentious halfwits. But when I actually bought bought that camera, it's the best camera I've ever had, and I use that all the time. So yeah, the Leica Q camera I think is amazing. I also uh, listen to a lot of music and I've got some good uh, audio equipment, some nice headphones. So I've got some Sennheiser headphones that, are, that I think are really good. And I'm also, being the nerd that I am, quite into watches. And although I've, I've got some kind of stereotypical kind of mechanical watches, I wear my g-shock every day so i really love g-shock watches <laughs> like which has no i was not uh, expecting that i was about to hear like breitling or omega or something like that and g-shock yeah but i i just think like i've got a little g-shock that it it it, it kind of illustrates brand value in, in a nutshell in a way but one, one of the things that i love about it is that the brief to create the g-shock was just the number 10 written three times. It should be survive a drop onto concrete from 10 meters 
have a 10 year battery life and be 10 bar water resistant. Off you go. That was the brief to create that's, the G shock. Cool. I didn't know that. And G shock has been a massively, massively successful product or line of products. They're in space, they're in the military, they're, they're everywhere. And the one that I've got that I wear every day, I'm not wearing, wearing it right now. I'm wearing something a little more ostentatious, but the, um, is solar powered entirely and it syncs to a satellite every night so it's perfectly on time all time all the time wherever you are in the world and it costs like 90 bucks i just think the technology and the performance is utterly utterly insane and it just works utterly flawlessly and there aren't many things in the world where you can say it just works utterly flawlessly but the g-shock is one of them and that's why I love it. Like my interest in watches has got not so not really to do with with brand or or status or anything like that. It's always been about aesthetics and design. So I like really love Swatch as well. Very innovative brand. I got a couple of of, of posh ones, but like my G Shock, I just think like for it to break, I have to have broken something a lot worse <laughs> so like that's a piece of technology that whenever i'm traveling whenever i'm doing anything i have it with me i think that's a great answer um you know i've had all sorts of answers software hardware um i haven't had a watch yet so that, that's a first um so this is the time to to plug um you know what you're working on what you do um for some people who may not know who you are um you have a, a business called methodical um so that's i'll put the yeah. link in the comments um thank you anything Anything else that you want to promote as well while you're here? Anything that I want to promote? Um, I, I would like more people to read The Grid, my second book, because I, I'm tremendously proud of it. I've worked extremely hard on it. The people who have read it have seemingly genuinely found it to be very useful for them. Um, and it was really a labor of love over, over the course of five years to, to put it together. And I, I think there are so many times in life where I think, oh, if they just read that, they wouldn't have done that stupid thing. Or maybe they've done some other stupid thing. We're always all doing stupid things. But I think that the grid book gives everybody a very good overview of how business actually works. And it gives that a horizontal bar along the top of the T that you were talking about yeah, that yeah. is so often missing. And I really, if I had to promote anything, yeah, one thing I think of my own stuff, then I'm really proud of the grid. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I've had really good feedback from some very highly people that I respect um, on, on that perspective and that grounding. Um, and my goal is to create a very similar book, but in the marketing field, that's, you know, of that same sort of quality. So I can see why it took you five years because there's a lot that's condensed down in, and there's an art to condensing a really complex subject into something smaller and bite sized that's readable. Uh, there's an art to that. Yeah. I think the art is just trying to keep your sanity while you do it <laughs> <laughs> rather than it being an, or, an or art to finish in, it it, in, in itself. Place. Yeah. Uh, as you can tell from my whiskey penchant, I'm a fan of distillation so <laughs> in, in any form. So yeah, I think um, it was, it was a tough, yeah, I think if I'd known what I was in for, I would never have started it. Oh, well, it's yeah, out. I, I'm really proud of it. That's great. Really and um, look, I really enjoyed this speech. Uh, last question. Um, best way to contact you? Um, if someone's a real fan and wants to ask you a question without you know being too annoying, uh, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah, probably LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on there, as you know. Uh, it's pretty easy to find me and get hold of me there. And um, I really do love to to interact with people and meet new people and yeah, and, and hear people's perspectives, good or bad. So, yeah, I'm, um, I'm all ears. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, um, well, look, I just really want to thank you for your time, Matt, because I know it's uh, very late where you are right now because of the time difference. So, um, cheers. And um, thank thanks for all the very cheers, interesting answers to, to my questions and putting up with me for an hour, and hour and a half. Um, and, yeah, look forward to potentially speaking again soon. Absolutely my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you so much.